No, I mean, architecture is political. We gotta, we gotta add that stuff. Indeed. We are tearing down communities to build multifamily and you have to understand we are creating displacement. You're displacing black and brown folks and they don't come back. Half of this podcast would be dedicated to the history of Tyler House, my journey and my discoveries. And hey, I'm going to solve this housing problem. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Melissa Daniels. This is the Architecturalist Political Podcast where black and brown folks talk about architecture. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and be part of my storytelling. I recently attended Green Build. This year, 2023, the conference was in Washington, D.C. I got an expo pass because Green Belt was tripping, okay? Like, I don't know what's going on today in terms of conferences' prices, but they is no joke. Okay, so I was fortunate enough to be gifted the expo pass. But if you're a non-member like me, it was $129. And I will be really upset if I paid $129 for access to that expo. Because it was chaos. It was a lot of people. So going back, the Washington, D.C. Convention Center has... I think it was about four levels. So last time when the AIA convention was in D.C., they took the entire like bottom level. And the bottom level is huge. Greenbelt took the top, top level, which is a quarter of its size compared to the one in the basement. So needless to say, I was unimpressed. So the next level is the networking package. As a non-member, it's $4.99. And the only difference is you got to attend the welcome reception and Thursday evening event, whatever that was. So that's the only difference. Mind you, and I didn't check this at all. I thought I was able to get CEUs because I do have a lead credential. And stupid me thought that the sessions that were in the expo hall, I'll get credit. But no, the sessions in the expo hall was like 20 minutes long and then it's a hall right so they didn't put up any barriers at all so the acoustics was horrible you couldn't hear anything it was just it was ugh, stupid me so in order for you to receive CEUs you have to get the full package and that includes the a virtual summit which you can go back and look at some of people's presentation workshops, you get to attend the keynote, as well as you getting credit. That was $1,400. $1,400, people. Like, that was insane. Who has that money? Attending the sessions was like the key thing. That's how you learn. And I'm sorry, guys, but I am beside myself. And they also had food pantry or something. Like they were, they had like fresh fruits that they were going to give away or something. I didn't pay much attention to it. I noticed it at the side. They had these boxes and I think they were filled with fruits and vegetables or something, but I don't know where that was going. I did not inquire about that. And now I'm talking about it. I'm curious as to what happened with all that. This is, I'm more about social climate justice, right? That's what makes me wake up and motivate about this whole green climate change and everything is the justice part of it. Because black and brown communities, they're in the worst locations. They're part of, they're at bus depots and plants and highways because redlining, they'll cut through and there's a major highway there, right? And little kids are breathing in the exhaust traffic on the highways. That's what I'm interested in. And what got me like mad about this? Because I'm mad. Like I was mad. I wasted my day, it feels like, um, attending Greenbelt because the exhibitors, 
I pretty much saw them earlier at the AIA convention. And some of them are questionable. And I'm like, are you really about green? Or were they just trying to get money from selling a booth? Like, I was questioning some of them, actually. And this is, like, off the surface, right? Because I didn't really talk to much people. Because, again, most of them were already at the AIA convention. Except they may be peddling a sustainable product instead of their most expensive product or something like that. But it's just the accessibility of learning about (laughs) doing right when it comes to the planet and to being able to specify truly green, sustainable products. Like, how do I build right? How do I know cradle to cradle thing, right? It reminded me of elitism on like level 52. That's what it reminded me of. Because unless you work for a large company or something to pay the, I'm sorry, I misquoted. So the 1400 was for if you're a USGBC member, non-members is $1,600. My bad, $1,600 to get some CEUs. That what I'm going to do, what I normally do every year is Go on a site that has like how CEUs, look for all the free ones and take that test. Take those exams. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what I've been doing. I'm going to continue to do. Hopefully they're still free. Who knows? But if I'm paying, I'm. I, it's going to be like, oh, I better get my bang for my buck because this is ridiculous. I'm just, oh, that's my rant about green build. And I'm bringing this all up because I don't normally interview in this style. I normally am um, chatty person. Then the Q&As comes naturally. I may have some questions that I'm itching to ask, and, but most of the time it's like, who are you? How are you? Get a backstory a little bit and then tell the story. This is different. I wrote an article for uh, Metropolis Magazine back in June, and it's called, Can We Actually Measure for Social Equity? Shout out to Kelly and Robbie for giving me an opportunity to write this piece. But I interviewed a bunch of people, including the one that you're about to hear after this intro. So I I had a pleasure of interviewing Rainy Shane for this news piece. I also interviewed a couple of other people as well. But this one I took to Zoom and I got a a pleasure of interviewing her for this piece. So this is basically a QA and a type conversation. I asked questions, she answered it. There may be a follow-up question, that sort of thing. But I thought it was interesting to capture this conversation and to post it on the podcast. I know it's like I did this back in June. And now it's not June or anywhere close to June right now. But and I wanted to meet her at Greenbelt. And because I did, I I'm so mad. I wanted to meet Rainy at Greenbelt. And she had a session, actually, and it was called Moving from Effort to Effect perspectives from the front lines on ESG reporting and strategy implementation beyond checking the box. She also had a couple of other well people, and I don't know what the other acronym means, but I wanted to attend a presentation, but of course I couldn't afford it. And then I was going to stalk the session, like just wait like maybe a half hour into the session or maybe show up at 45 minutes later and then smooze on in and introduce myself then because, you know, I don't know her schedule. And then I was going to maybe hit her up and I realized I didn't have her LinkedIn. I do have her email, but I was like, how often do you check your email? I just, I was just planning on just showing up and introducing myself. And the stupid, it's an app, right? That you, it's, this is an app. And I did not know what room she was in. Because I had an expo pass and the expo pass didn't tell you about the sessions because they just block you on that level. It was a missed opportunity for me to meet her and I really wish I did. So sorry, I couldn't introduce myself in real life in 3D, rainy, but maybe some other time we can meet in person. And you know what? Now I'm looking at it. 
I should have checked online because it shows the room that she was in. I'm looking at it right now because I wanted to read off the Titan the name and it says it on. It was just a total missed opportunity all the way around and I'm kicking myself for it. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I thought I asked pretty good questions and I'll also link the article that I wrote that included her in it. Again, it's called, Can We Actually Measure for Social Equity? So check it out, read the link. And here you go. I forgot to mention before we jump into the episode, what is this episode about and who is this person and and their program? So Rainy Shane is the co-founder of SEAM. SEAM is an acronym for Social Equity Assessment Method. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization that created the SEAM standard and administers a social equity certification for commercial real estate projects. SEAM is a third-party standard for real estate projects that certifies an organization's action towards social sustainability as measured against internationally accepted criteria. It is a vehicle for organizations to leverage commercial real estate and use it to make authentic, measurable gains in social responsibility beyond the health and wellness to encompass matters like justice and equity. And as far as the article, again, from Metropolis, can we actually measure for social equity? I'm really proud that I was able to gather women. First of all, they're all women and they're all women of color, with the exception of, of Rainey. But I am proud that I got four Black women quoted in this article. This is great. That was my goal. That was my, I was like, if I'm going to write something, first of all, I'm going to make sure someone that I've interviewed in my podcast is going to be on there because whoever it is, is going to be awesome. And secondly, the network of Black women that I am so blessed to have to just call them up and like, hey, I'm writing an article. I need you. I need a quote. And they were like, yes, Melissa, hands down. So I am grateful for the people who were able to do this, like, at a drop of a hat. And for those who didn't know me, like Rainy, thank you also for for allowing me to interview you. So hope you guys enjoy it. Again, here you go. Rainy, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? (laughs) Thanks. Okay. So the first question How does SEAM define social equity and how does it compare to other definitions of the concept? The way that we define social equity is that no group should have less power, fewer benefits or rights than any other group, regardless of race, geography, gender, age, ability, religion, or any other qualifying trait. And I think most people are aligned on this definition. It's really where the social responsibility comes into play that we start to diverge a little bit. And SEAM looks at social responsibility as addressing all of the impacts that your project or your business or whatever activities you're doing, addressing the impacts on all of the stakeholders of those activities and not just specific targeting of donations or volunteering to certain issues, making sure you're looking at all the issues and all the stakeholders. Similar to LEAD, there is a SEAM AP as well as membership. Can you provide more details on that? Sure. The SEAM accredited professional credential is a lot like LEAD. It's a lot like WELL APs. It is a specialized consultant and it performs most of the tasks to guide a client through a SEAM certification that would normally in some other certifications be outsourced to a third party and lead and you've got commissioning and testing type consultants. And in the SEAM certification, the SEAM AP does most of those consulting tasks like social impact assessment and human rights due diligence, there are less third-party consultants that have to be hired to do a SEAM certification. 
because of that specialization for the CMAP. And then the membership to the nonprofit is similar to every other membership that you would get. There are membership benefits, networking opportunities, education, events, things that really align with the social equity movement within commercial real estate. Who is seen aimed for and who's the ideal stakeholder? Really any project owner undertaking any type of commercial real estate project, but those that are aligned to pursuing sustainable development, which is essentially a development that doesn't cause anyone or any stakeholder to fall short on life's essentials. So mitigating adverse impact to those stakeholders and the ideal stakeholder for a project, ultimately, it is the full range of stakeholders that are impacted. But the way that we prioritize is the stakeholders that are experiencing the most salient human rights issues are prioritized on that stakeholder list. Ultimately, the stakeholders that are experiencing adverse impacts would be the ones that we address. First. And so those would be the ideal stakeholders that we are attempting to mitigate impacts for. What does it mean for an enterprise to receive a SEAM certification? And do you think that it could potentially replace MBEs or WBE certifications? The SEAM certification is not actually an organizational certification, it is targeted and focuses specifically on a project. Now, the criteria for the, a lot of the governance and process issues could be adopted by an organization if they wanted to do those things organization-wide, but the requirements of SEAM only look at how it's applied to the project. Ultimately, it would never replace minority business enterprise or women's business enterprise because those are designations for a firm and SEAM certification is really looking at the process by which you're conducting activities versus just looking specifically at a diversity designation, which is what those designations are that you called out. How has SEAM handled critics, particularly in the current political climate where social equity issues are highly contested? This is an interesting question. I'm glad you asked it because I speak at a lot of commercial real estate conventions and and presentations. Everyone is always surprised when I say that we receive hate mail. (laughs) And in my last panel, someone asked specifically, how do we address things like Ron DeSantis in Florida trying to outlaw diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives? And what I would say, and and how we typically address this, is we simply stick to our truth, which is that we're all on the same side, whether they know it or not. And social equity includes everyone, including them. And I would say that critics that believe humans are not equal based on some type of characteristic, race, gender, age, may never agree with what we're trying to do and with our standard. But that doesn't mean that we stop fighting for their equity too. There is a lot of dogma to overcome and that's not going to happen overnight. But ultimately, taking the air out of the combative nature of the conversation is really how we're trying to deal with it because equity is for everyone. And so that's them as well. (laughs) Can you provide any examples of real estate companies that have successfully completed a SEAM cert? Not yet, but hopefully later this year, the pilot projects that we're working on right now will be wrapping up. And so perhaps we talk again later this year. (laughs) I will say that we're starting to see some changes and some of the impacts of doing these pilot projects And it's starting to get really exciting. We've got some companies that have never had a human rights policy or a modern slavery policy or a vendor code of conduct or sustainable procurement policies. And it's not that they didn't care. 
they didn't know how to write a policy or they didn't know how to implement one at their company or what to actually implement. And so taking these companies' intentions and guiding their efforts in the right ways is really starting to pay off. And so towards the end of this year, when we've got those impact reports from the activities that they're doing as part of the same certification is going to be incredibly rewarding for us. So hit me back around November. <laughs> November of this year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I would say we're probably six months, four to six months for the first pilot to wrap up, but then others following in towards Q3, Q4, we're going to have a lot to report. How long is the process so far? If it's a buildings and interiors, like a, a construction project, whether you're building a building or a, an office, office fit out, the same certification takes as long as the project. So we get in early at the concept phase and we go all the way through close out and turning it over to operations. Now the operations and maintenance certification, which is on an existing property, that could take a lot less time. And it could happen within three to six months, depending on how far of a level, like how high the level of the certification is, or how many retroactive actions that we have to take to change things. So companies that are further along in their social equity journey may get through one of those a lot quicker than someone that's early on in their journey. Here's another off question. How would you summarize seem in like a sentence? Typically, we say we are the world's first social equity certification for commercial real estate. So that's in a nutshell what we're doing. I, I could take it a little further to say the world's first social equity certification for commercial real estate, which aims to prevent or mitigate negative impacts and optimize opportunities to create positive impacts for all stakeholders. Something that comes to mind too, there was this article regarding a Black couple and their appraisal was lower than than expected to be. Would you say that your cert could have mitigate that in some way? So indirectly, we do have, there's a section in the scorecard that looks at equity and justice in the community and looking at making sure that commercial real estate projects don't have any type of involuntary displacement, right? Eminent domain. But there's also a section about not encroaching on the community that looks at some gentrification type issues. Ultimately, there is a commercial real estate impact on the community where it lives. And if their property, ultimately, I think you're talking about racism, would be my guess if it's a black couple that's receiving a lower appraisal than some other couple with a similar house i think you're probably looking at at racism so ours wouldn't necessarily directly impact that right you wouldn't you can't your program can't solve the racist problem in the world <laughs> i wish it could i wish it could but no it it doesn't it really looks to make sure that there's a whole social justice section in the scorecard. And it's really about how you complete the process for hiring, procuring the project team, looking at human rights abuses in the supply chain, and those could be for any reason. While we definitely look at those social justice issues within the context of a commercial real estate project, in general, I don't think that we're going to impact racism <laughs> in a generalized way, just within the way that you do the project, making sure that that not only is it there's no discrimination in the ways that you're conducting the real estate project, but also making sure that you're giving equal opportunities to diverse designations for businesses and workforce. When I went on your website, it wasn't really clear how you measure it. And I didn't ask that question because I didn't know how to phrase it, but now we're talking. So how do you measure social equity that within your cert? Yeah, so 
That's the tricky piece with any social intervention because there's not an established international alignment on what the indicators are for social equity. And so our certification is based on international standards and where there are indicators like in UN Sustainable Development Goals, they just came out with some a whole new list of indicators we will align to those indicators but for each activity there's usually multiple criteria so let me give you an example for living wage if we're looking at living wage that's pretty easy you either pay it or you don't so our indicator would be essentially the living wage gap what Mm -hmm. is the percentage that you're paying living wage that's very easy but if you look at decent work has multiple criteria It looks at no child labor, no forced labor, collective bargaining. Do you give, looking at the working hours, discrimination, harassment, like there's all these things. And so we measure based on all those criteria. And there's this big, long formula that looks at multiple criteria and weights them across multiple criteria and ultimately comes up with a percentage. So that percentage progress towards the criteria can be measured year over year and to understand your progress. It can also be compared to your peers if you're looking to benchmark where you are within your industry. So there are anywhere from 58 to 66 activities, depending on the the version of scorecard that, that you're going for. And each one of those is a percentage And that percentage translates into a score. And that's how you ultimately get your score on the scorecard. And again, some of the indicators are aligned to the international standards where they're applicable. And then some of them are just progressed against criteria that, again, comes from international standards. So in terms of a project, for example, can you provide any measurement towards that? in terms of the built environment or as for architects, for example? For architects, the activities that apply would be inclusive design. What percentage of the project is inclusively designed? And so that's a measure that an architect would have a lot of input on. There is also looking at the architects procuring their sub-consultants. And and sometimes the architect will hire the structural engineer and the the landscape art engineer. And so you can measure the percentage of diversity in the procurement. It's hard to say what the progress is because every same certification is going to be like a snowflake, right? A thumbprint. Because there are so many activities, there will be an impact report that says, here's the progress that they made. Maybe they started out and they had 5% diversity in the prospective procurement of consultants. And after going through the same certification, we pushed them up to 30%. And so that would be a measurable impact. Or maybe the gender wage gap for the project team was 20%. And through the same certification, they made progress on the gender wage gap or closed the gender wage gap or the Mm -hmm. diversity wage gap. So the impacts are going to be very activity focused. And ultimately, you'll get a score at the end, which allows you to determine what the certification level is. But every client that goes through same certification would have a very specific impact report that they could use and share with the public or shareholders or on their reporting frameworks if they happen to report on ESG. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. What's ESG? It is a rating system to understand how a company is performing against environmental, social, and governance issues related to their business. And mostly it's public companies that are tracking their ESG score, and it allows their investors to rate them against their peers. So, Okay, last question. How does seeing differ from other equities certifications? Mainly because it's project-based and that it's comprehensive 
for all stakeholders. And there are a few ways that SEAM differs from other certifications. Let's just look at just and well equity. The just label, again, it's looking more at the organization. It's an organizational certification versus a project certification. And then well equity is more focused on the organization and the building occupants. And it's more targeted towards health and wellness. And it looks at the equity of health and wellness, being able to equitably apply health and wellness to all building occupants and all employees of that organization. And SEAM certification is really a comprehensive look at all stakeholders. One of the things that we do that's very different is we do an assessment on the front end and we understand specifically what are the key issues facing this real estate project, the community where it lives, its supply chain, and understanding who really are the stakeholders. We do a full stakeholder map and stakeholder analysis, and we understand who is impacted or who could likely be impacted from this real estate project. And then we look at how severely are they impacted and how important is that impact to them. We reach out and we full stakeholder engagement where we understand from the stakeholders view how they view those impacts. And so when we start creating initiatives in the SEAM certification, they are very focused and targeted to the exact stakeholder, the key issues that are salient, so that the impact that this project's going to have is much more significant and more impactful. The other thing we do is we embed foundational driver activities with criteria in the scorecard because with any type of social sustainability program or strategy if you don't do these foundational activities correctly like stakeholder mapping community profile value chain analysis some governance issues if you don't do those correctly it's hard to get the later stages correct so we embed those driver activities which creates a roadmap for a client to walk through a step-by-step social sustainability strategy that they don't have to guess. We guide them through it. The other thing is that the way that we weight the scoring for the scorecard is based on the UN guiding principles guidance that says prioritization should be based on salient human rights. And so we went through every single activity And we did a whole weighting exercise. And so the most points that you can get are going to be for the more salient human rights issues. So it's weighted according to salient human rights. And then the other thing that we do is there's this concept of you cannot offset human harm. So if I fly across the country, I can buy some carbon credits to offset that impact. But if you build a building and you use a lot of materials that were created using child labor, slave labor, modern slavery, forced labor, you can't go and make a donation to a nonprofit organization and offset the harm that you did to those people. So one of the things that we do is the way that we judge the criteria is that you can't get points for creating positive benefits until you have prevented or mitigated the negative impacts that you've created. And that, again, is based on that premise that you can't do something bad and then get points for doing something good. And so that is embedded into every single activity throughout the scorecard. Hmm. So those are just some design characteristics for the way that the design of the program and the standard and the scoring system that is a bit different But again, we're focused on social, right? It's all about humans. It's all about the direct impact on humans. And so there are a lot of factors that we have to take into consideration because we're measuring people and not things. How did you come up with the categories? Great question. So I didn't come up with anything. I don't want to 
sit here and try to tell you that this is the brainchild. I came up with the categories and the concepts. What my contribution is taking these international standards that are internationally accepted and agreed. They are frameworks that were rather difficult to figure out a way to implement them. And so all I did was I looked at what the international standards said and created a system to walk someone through being able to implement those standards and framework in their project, in their commercial real estate project, so that we prevent adverse impacts from that project and optimize benefits. That's all I did. I created a framework around standards that have been in existence for decades and people agree on them. They were just, they would read them and be like, how in the world does that apply to my real estate project? And that's all I did is I translated it and I created it. I created an action plan for implementing it into a project. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Architecture's Political Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it informative or at least entertaining. If you like what you heard, please share with others. You can also connect with Arcus Polly on social media, currently on Instagram, as well as Facebook and Twitter. If for more information, visit us on our website. It's arcuspolly.online, A-R-C-H-I-P-O-L-L-Y dot online. I also want to thank our loyal supporters who have been with this podcast for at least three years. It means the world to me, and I'm totally grateful to have you part of this community. I will try to bring you the best content as possible, and I can't wait to share more amazing episodes with you. If this is your first time listening or just like a particular episode or all of them, you can support this podcast by going on glow.fm slash arcuspoly. Again, thank you for your support. It means the world to me. And thank you so much for listening.